This video is about how a person can become effective individually, where if for some reason you can't depend on a group and, or you um, <coughs> aren't involved with a group, but you need to become a capable person individually, well, this is the video on doing that. And naturally, when you're talking about somebody who is doing things as an individual, there is going to be a lack of resources, funds, uh, things like that. So despite the limitations of being an individual, you can, if you have the knowledge, become possibly even more effective than many organizations through the lack of things like overhead cost of uh, <clears throat> operations and whatnot. So, um, if a person needs to do things on their own, just in general, they will need to become efficient and effective just by themselves. And nowadays, considering the general lack of distrust that people have among their neighbors, and for most other people that aren't, say, their friends or whatnot, and even then a lot of people might not trust their friends to a certain extent, well, then you just have to go out and do things on your own. And fortunately today, not many know how to do that. The first component that's important to becoming effective and proficient as an individual is research and analysis. Before you start anything, you need to do the homework, as it were, study up on what those things are that you need to know, what components you might need, and then of course, among the research that you gather, you need to analyze it and determine what is applicable to the specific situation that uh, that individual might be dealing with. Now for research and analysis, there's a few mechanisms or things that I use. One of those is or are business filings. When it comes to business filings, a person can learn a lot simply from the names that are listed on paperwork. Sometimes you get lucky and you get extensive paperwork which lists out details that can be useful for whatever thing, mission, operation, uh, task you might be doing. But this all starts with, of course, digging through paperwork, company filings. And when it comes to a lot of companies that aren't singularly local, a lot of them are uh, have multiple chains in which information will leak through. Because with the more variables involved, the more likely it is that a person can find things. Of course, business filings are tend to be extremely convoluted and a rabbit hole, a maze of uh, complex paperwork uh, filings that link to different things. And so naturally, when working with that type of thing, it's important to understand that you might not immediately discover what you're looking for. You have to do research. Then a resource that has become incredibly useful for my own purposes is reading through the Amicus Curie. According to Wikipedia, an Amicus Curie is an individual organization that is not a party to a legal case but that is permitted to assist the court by offering information, expertise, or insight that has a bearing on the issues in the case. Whether an amicus brief will be considered is typically under the court's discretion. The phrase is legal Latin, and the origin of the term has been dated to 1605 to 1650. Of course, they don't define what the term means. It means, essentially speaking, friend of the court. However, a lot, a lot of these amicus briefs, they give you general overall uh, understanding of how to draft a properly formed legal document. And researching these can also provide other types of information, who's in, involved in things and uh, what certain, in many cases, what certain entities do not want to be even talked about. Now, two of these examples that I've looked at is an amicus curiae brief or an amicus brief coming from a lawyer out of Rome talking about the juridical status of the Vatican Bank. And it has other names. And then another one that has been incredibly useful was a brief coming from the International Code Council. 
but I'm sure there's many other useful ones out there. But the important part is that this gives you an understanding of how they, uh, how many different entities might construct their legal reports, how they will do referencing and things like that. And some don't even reference, they simply use terminology, while others reference only court cases. But then whatever the research is being done here, that information can be used by the researching and through the analysis process essentially for whatever way is applicable. Another point of research for gathering information gathering would come from uh, <coughs> documentation on locations. A lot of these in the United States anyway can be found through county uh, office websites. Some of them are the clerks, uh, others are kept by uh, the commissioners or, or whatnot. It all just depends on which, which uh, mechanism the location uses. One of the things I would suggest is if you're looking for something in a particular state that you're, say, not familiar with, is to search for a address lookup or a uh, real estate document lookup based off of the address. And that will likely take you to the page that you're looking for because a lot of these websites are convoluted and it takes a while to find out how to locate the information on a particular plot of land and address, who owns it, who sold it, things like that. And then all of that information can be then used to do more research, such as if you look up the sale, uh, the sales on a particular piece of land and those relate to a business, then you can go to business filings and look up information on perhaps who signed those business filings and who do they link to uh, as far as being a subsidiary or what other types of business filing connections they might have. And then, of course, if you're attempting to find addresses for individuals or in a certain area, a group of people, then you can go and look up voting records. Now, a lot of them might not be current. And as far as I'm aware, most secretaries of state in the different states in the United States keep their own voting records. And from those, you could look up perhaps what the more current ones are. And this is incredibly helpful for if you're attempting to do a letter campaign, uh, essentially send a, out a public notice about something that might be happening in a certain area. And of course, naturally, you have to understand what you're dealing with here. There's a lot of fake information, so it does take some discernment to decipher which is legitimate or otherwise. Of course, if you wanted to do the effort behind it, you can correlate voter records to business filings. And of course, the you can look up the specific um, address that might be listed to determine whether it's real or not. Now, the next after the next step after research and development is, I would term it, forming legal instruments or the legality where you actually draft up paperwork. And this would, of course, be based off of the research that was done prior. According to Wikipedia, draft document in the context of writing composition, drafting refers to any process of generating preliminary versions of a written work. Drafting happens at any stage of the writing process as writers generate trial versions of the text they're developing. That's applicable to what we're um, desiring to do here, which is essentially form actionable pieces of paperwork that can then be sent out to different sources or simply to be used as evidence or essentially for any requirement that is needed as far as the actual formulating paperwork goes. And this could, of course, be done online. It could be done by hand. But it is uh, naturally would be, anyway, the next step after research and analysis. Now, a couple things to keep in mind when drafting documents of this nature is to keep it professional, as it were. So some things, depending on the cir circumstances and situations, that would be important is to avoid direct accusations, to use terminology like 
possibly appears, seems, allegedly, or the evidence suggests that type of language. Well, you're not directly stating that you know unequivocally that this is the case, but simply that it is the most likely case based off of the research that has been done. And the avoiding of accusations is important in many circumstances because if you directly accuse someone, uh, it gives opens up a pretext to have your efforts shut down. Whether or not that's a waffle or otherwise, it's sort of it's not it's not always applicable because sometimes if you want to get something done, you just have to do it uh, understand what you're dealing with, right? You just have to do what's effective. And if you know that making direct accusations will pose a problem, just simply avoiding directly accusing anyone will ensure that your efforts are more effective. Of course, that goes with not being, well, not letting emotions affect the effort. So that's what the whole idea of being remaining professional is. You don't do things or you try to avoid anyway, the inclusion of personal vendetta. You don't do things in the sense of personal aggrandizement because when you do quote unquote make it personal, then that can be used as a mechanism to attack your work just off those grounds alone. So if you want to remain above reproach as it were, retaining a professional nature and not getting sucked into any sort of personal debate, any type of personal relations where they say, oh, you know, we should just work this out one-on-one, -on -one, you know, that kind of stuff. You just don't get involved in it. You retain a 100% professional uh, approach, as it were. Now, the next step to this drafting process is to use correct terminology. This requires essentially research and analysis on definitions. You might be using the right word in a certain context, but if it's if the definition of that word is used differently, then they might misread what you are putting out. So there's a few things to keep in mind when determining the correct terminology to use. The first element to keep in mind when it comes to correct terminology is tradition. How has the word been used in the past? Where does the word come from? That's very important because if somebody tells you that you're using the word wrong, well, you can point to the fact that it traditionally has been used this way. So you're not using the word wrong. You just might not be using the word correctly in their context, but you're still using the word correctly as it's based off of tradition. Now, the next thing is customary use. That's how people use it today, how in custom the word is used. Now, customary use might not be the correct use of a word, but it is still, in that context anyway, the correct use. It's what people understand the word to mean through their use. And oftentimes, traditional use does not equate to customary use. So if you're attempting to get your point across, you do have to keep in mind how people understand that word, not just how it's been used in the past. But you have to understand, of course, that how it's been used in the past is not inherently a wrong way to use it. You just might need to define the fact that this is the traditional form of the use versus a customary form and vice versa. So custom is extremely important as it go comes down to having others understand what you're saying. And then comes the form of legitimacy, the legitimacy of the word use. Now, this is a bit tricky because there's a large number of words that are used illegitimately. One of those is the word legal. Legal means reduced to writing a document of apparent lawful nature. However, it may or may not be legitimate depending on the particular circumstance. And so here you have the example of somebody who is attempting to appear in a certain way, but they are not legitimately that. And that's where we get the understanding of the legitimacy of 
words, which word is the legitimate one to use, and which one might hold the appearance of it, but not necessarily be legitimate. Now, there's a lot of different examples that can be used for this. One of them would be somebody using the terminology from the Constitution, but outside the constitutional context. And thus, they are, in fact, using that terminology illegitimately because they're attempting to gain the disguise of the Constitution while, in fact, violating it. And that is an incredibly common occurrence today. Oftentimes, when you hear somebody say something is illegal, it means different things, and they may be using it, that word anyway, illegitimately. Now, this is the main reason why, in most legal documents, those who draft them are continuously defining their terms. Usually, at the beginning, or sometimes if they're trying to be really sneaky at the end of documentation, they will define their terms and say, we are using this term in this way. This is our definition of that term. And when people read that document, often they won't read the definitions that are being put forth, especially if it's a very long document. And so if you have a, con well, in that case, a lot of people might read that document and think that the person saying one thing, but they're actually saying something else. And in order to find out what else they're saying, they would have to go to the, in many cases, long uh, section on defining of terms. But this is sort of something you can't just get around. You do, in fact, have to define your terms on the context of traditional custom and legitimate use. And this also comes down, of course, to the formulation of words. Some words might be used customarily, but the word in itself is false because it was not formulated in a correct manner. Thus, it's illegitimate. An example of this would be the word pseudoscience, which is a combining of French and Latin and is using the term pseudonym where the O comes from in pseudoscience, because logically it would be sued science if you're attempting to say false science, but the word pseudoscience is not a legitimately constructed word because it's using, it's pulling from two different languages and following none of their word construction regulations, as it were. So it might be a customary, a, use, a word used in custom that many understand to mean this one thing, but it's still illegitimate. And if the need arises, documents may need to be translated. Now, most of my documentation and translation that I do, I do with software. And that's inherently faulty because then you have to go through and find all of the errors that program, computer programs inherently do, which includes repetition of certain positions, running together words that are supposed to be separate. And all of those things would be a dead giveaway of what you're editing uh, software is, or that you used in editing software, and also it looks very unprofessional. So those things can be picked apart as far as your paperwork is concerned when you're writing these type of documents and you want them to be as airtight as possible. So getting your stuff thrown out just because of faulty translation would be uh, very irritating. Next we come to the element of references. Now there's a couple way to do references and there's not exactly any singular approach, despite what brain-dead professors at universities might say. Some people put their references into footnotes. Others put references into the document itself, while yet others will might put an index at the front or the back of a particular publication to show which references they're using. However, most use a mixture of different techniques, and I prefer, usually, to quote points, to put reference points within the document that lead to an index at the back. So if you quote the same source multiple times, you equally put a reference to that source every multiple point that you do, and then they can go and find the full version of the reference, or at least the full version uh, or the snippet that might be referenced that's required, not necessarily the entire thing, right? Like, you're not going to reference a book and then include the entire book in an index. Probably just include the 
publication information. And essentially speaking, the idea behind references is so that people can go and then find the source being described. So you want to make it as easy as possible for them to at least attempt to go and find it. Some things might make references where the actual reference document is impossible to find because it has been pulled out of circulation. Essentially, it's hard to track down and that's when you need something like an antiquarian and things like that. And when you're talking about this level of effort, usually uh, hiring an antiquarian for uh, finding a, a reference is unlikely. That's for most specialized circumstances, but it might be required in some cases. Either way, including references that are well made with the intent of making it easy for the reader to find is a professional way to do it versus what you find with a lot of different references where they make it tedious and difficult, which is in fact the opposite of the idea behind making references. Now, one of the things I do in Word in order to put references into a document that are not jarring is by using a super index. The super indices can be found in the uh, initial section of Word, and it usually is represented with an X and then a number two. Now you can put this at the bottom or at the top, and I usually put it at the top right of a word at the end of, say, a sentence where I'm making a reference to something. Now comes the uh, component for editing. Often, a good way to uh, edit is by having somebody else look at your documents. But if that's an impossibility, then another way to do this is take what you're doing, set it aside for a day or two, then come back to it and read through it, and you'll find a large number of edits that you missed. So there's multiple stages in editing, and it is all dependent on the circumstance and for what level of work you're attempting to do. Generally, most first pass edits, meaning you look at it right after you edit it, will be able to catch many things, but then it might leave some other rather, rather, rather egregious jarring errors uh, that you'll catch later. And the idea of putting a work aside after you've written it is very good for editing purposes because if you try to edit it right after you wrote it, well, your mind might actually fix some of the errors that you're reading that another reader who doesn't who who didn't write it will catch because their mind is not filtering out those errors that you might have put in there so that's a very important component for editing now there's many other errors to keep in mind when you're doing this work there's not just the usual grammatical mistakes the incorrect terminology the type of errors where you uh, have rep repetition based off of using software or words run together that should be separate. There's a lot many, or, or of course, uh, incorrectly referenced passages, but there's a lot of other errors that should be focused on removing, which of course include formatting, readability, whether or not somebody can read your things and they won't fall asleep, get lost. All of those things are very important to consider not just all of the simple mistakes, but also some of the more complex ones. Uh, this could include whether or not the concepts being put forth are in fact, um, can, can be understood by the reader. Because in some cases you might have con uh, concepts that are too complex and have a great deal of research and explanation behind them required. And in that case, it would be on the drafter of the document to comprehend that and write their stuff in a way that it could be that it's essentially written from the perspective of their intended audience. Now our next component is going to be enforcement. After you have done the research and the analysis and you've drafted the do uh, document itself, the essentially putting it out into the field as it were situation comes. And that might be one of the more difficult ones. That's where it's uh, everything else, all the work up has been done, and now it's time for action. Now, most of us think about enforcement only in the context of using force of arms, say a firearm, missiles, weapons. But most enforcement today actually happens more through paperwork, through filing, 
and through other sorts of mechanisms, resources, for instance, to get somebody to do something that you want without having to resort to violence. As it says in The Art of War, the first person to fire a shot is the one that's lost. That's because all the other mechanisms that revolve and come down to the use of violence have to be done first. And usually the person who has no recourse left but to use violence has already lost their resources. They've already been forced to do something based off of other circumstances than simple, uh, simple use of violence. When it comes to enforcement, psychology is a very important component. You'll be dealing with an opposition which may or may not desire to do what you tell them. If letters don't work, then you have to resort to other mechanisms. However, if you can understand their perspective and where they're coming from, then you can tailor your work specifically to force them to do what you want through a letter alone. Simply sending a letter which has teeth to it and that person recognizes that it does may get what you want from them. And this is usually what, say, attorneys or members of governments, so-called government entities or corporations will do, right? The first thing that they do is paperwork. When somebody messes up in a company, they get a write-up. When that company wants to enforce something against someone else, they send a demand letter. So a lot of these things have to do with psychology. On the other hand, in some cases, even though you think that something might not work, it would be a good idea just to attempt it simply for the aspect that doing it this one way would be easier than others. On the other hand, if you don't want to tip your hand to them, it might be better not to let them know what you're doing, especially when you're talking about somebody who, when you notify them, they might go to ground, run away, or they might respond in some way. And in that context, it's better to have all the cards, as it were, before you notify them of <clears throat> what you're what you want from them, as it were. So when it comes to psychology, it is not always the best approach to do the you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Sometimes, because this is not a cookie cutter situation, it is important to put a little vinegar into your work. Essentially the do this or this type of stuff happens, you know, that kind of thing. On the other hand, in some cases, you might want to give them a way out, a way to save face. So it all comes down to what is necessary, what you want done, and what the best way to do that is. And there's never really a single right answer for it. And in many cases, there's no wrong answer either. Sometimes, some people might do things in a more direct approach, and others might be a little bit more flowery with it, but both essentially achieve the same objective. So it's not always right or wrong to be intimidating or be nice, but it does depend on the situation which one will be more effective. Of course, when it comes to the enforcement mechanism, paperwork is your friend. Just like a lot of these corrupt organizations do today, they try to bury their opponents in paperwork. They try to bury people around them in paperwork. They use paperwork as a weapon, and it's a two-way street. You see, an individual who has no overhead, who has no salaries to pay or anything like that, sure, they might have to invest a lot of time in drafting a lot of paperwork, but if you do it correctly, then you can draft, draft a lot of paperwork, which is applicable to multiple situations. And in that way, you can dump loads of paperwork onto organizations or other individuals at the same time as you're doing it to somebody else. It's a very effective tactic. And there's a reason why companies and organizations do it, but they don't want other individuals doing it to them because this type of effort can, in fact, bury somebody who has a lot of overhead. Whereas it might be a little bit overwhelming to an individual, but by and large, most people can deal with a lot of paperwork when they don't have any cost associated with it. Now, the other thing is that if you're dealing with, in many cases, uh, individuals who do not respect you, that means that they will not do what you say because they don't believe that you're capable of giving them consequences for not doing it.
And in those cases, if you know that, if you've determined it, or if you know it beforehand and you know that sending them paperwork is useless, then what you do is you look for people around them. You go after their clients. If you're dealing with an attorney, generally a letter to an attorney is going to do nothing. So you go after their clients by sending them letters. And then that will make the attorney look at you and say, oh, this is somebody that is capable that I'm dealing with. Possibly. Depending on the level of uh, <clears throat> how good the work is, as it were. So if you're dealing with somebody who's entrenched and you say, oh, no, this can't be done. Well, then they won. What you want to do instead is say, this person won't budge, so I need to find a way to make them. That is what enforcement is all about. One of the other tactics that is well known to most political organizations is the letter writing campaign. A lot of people know about this. It's not just a way for spies to get coded messages through to their followers in different places. It can also be effective to the individual. When you have somebody who doesn't do what you want them to do, or in general, when you have somebody who's doing something bad, you do a letter writing campaign. You try to cast as wide a net as possible to send it out to publish that work. Now, this could also come in the form of online publications, publishing dirt on somebody, just to generally get it out there. Those types of things, even though they're practiced by attorneys and they're practiced by corporations and they're practiced by phony government outfits and different uh, different groups and whatnot, well, mostly it's taught not to do this because it's incredibly effective. When somebody doesn't want something to be put out there and they think that you're not going to do anything to them, this is a method that's very effective that doesn't require any sort of violence. It is simply publishing the information out there to increase adverse variables for the individual or organization who does not respect the this, um, this approach type of deal. And in some cases, it's just better to do it anyway, especially when you're dealing with um, a ring of thieves acting under color of law those types of scenarios. It's very important for the enforcement component to understand that you're dealing with an opponent. In any situation in which you need to force somebody to do something, they don't necessarily want to do that. If they wanted to do what you wanted them to do, then you wouldn't need to force them to do it. The idea of enforcement is making somebody do something they wouldn't otherwise do. And in that context, you are dealing with an opponent. Now, naturally, one of the effective tactics to get somebody to do what you want them to do, but without you actually having to expend your resources, is to notify their enemies. In business circles, this would come down to publishing things to the competition, the opposition of another company that you're dealing with. And this could take many different forms, but either way, the idea is that you give the tools over to somebody else who they have made an enemy of, and those people will expend resources on it where you don't have to. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, as it were. This is especially important for those individuals out there who have made numerous enemies because of their stubborn and their aggressive demeanor, which we are seeing very strongly today in large corporations, in uh, local government, false governments anyway, and religious groups. And generally speaking across the board, you have all of these people who have dropped pretense and have just become nasty individuals to deal with. And all of those people inherently will have made enemies. So if you research and analyze them and then form effective legal instruments, then instead of going around and trying to spread it everywhere, you can just deliver it to a uh, disenfranchised <laughs> individual who already has, just needs the means, the pretext, as it were, to get the person who, to get vengeance, as it were. And in that case, you still achieve the objective. You might not, um, you might not, uh, get the self-aggrandizement of doing it yourself. But either way, this is an effective approach 
especially when you're talking about entrenched people who disrespect your capability to impose consequences on them. So now we're going to come down to three particular scenarios, which many people are worried about today. Of course, in the past, these scenarios have been applicable. And when it comes down to scenarios, it's important not to identify one single individualistic scenario, but rather types of scenarios that somebody might encounter and the likelihood of those scenarios coming to pass. The first scenario is crisis. Crisis can come in many different forms. You have catastrophic crisis. You might have multiple crises at the same time. These could be economical, environmental, or they could be personal. There's many different sort of crises that people worry about. But for the context of this video, the crisis we're going to focus on to be uh, aware of for how to plan for it would essentially be external crises, things that happen, essentially speaking, outside of your control that you, well, nothing's technically outside of anyone's control, but essentially something catastrophic that happens in uh, an area that affects the individual and thus requires a response to deal with it how you will respond to that crisis. Now today, a lot of crises affect big cities. That's because the infrastructure is designed to create mayhem and chaos when something breaks. So if a city gets flooded, people don't know what to do, where to go, how to plan for it. Unless, of course, they've been prepared for it to begin with. This, of course, is the idea behind preppers, people who prepare for crisis. And there are many different types of crisis. You can't prepare for all of them, but at least you can determine what your approach will be and what the more critical components will be in a crisis. One of the main things to think about when it comes to a crisis is movement. In many cases where it looks like there's nowhere to go, nothing to do, everything's been blocked off, which is the go-to approach for most crisis response today, especially under the phoning government, is that what they'll want to do is inflict more casualties and more destruction than possible to bring more attention to the crisis through their shelter-in-place policy. I've done videos on this stuff before. The shelter-in-place policy essentially is the idea to restrict people's travel, to force them to stay in their homes, or even force them to stay in the location when a crisis is happening. And in order to do this, they'll do things like block access to roads, restrict transportation. However, even when it seems like there's nowhere to go and nothing to do, there usually still is a way to travel to get around those restrictions, even if those restrictions are natural, such as a road being blocked by a mudslide or a road disappearing in a flood. There are still ways to travel it is up to the creativity of the individual to find a way around it. To assist in this finding a way around obstructions when it comes to blockage of travel during crisis, topographical maps can be very useful, mostly restricted to online because if you had a physical topographical map, it would be a terrain model and it would be a little bit unwieldy. There are topographical maps, of course, out of paper that you can fold up, which of course the military uses and still uses as far as land navigation goes, but most people understand topographical maps as far as three-dimensional renderings on a computer program. So these are important when you're doing research around an area to know the terrain, the actual physical terrain of things, the elevations and all that stuff, rather than just looking at a singular um, map, like a road map or whatnot. But in most cases today, topographical maps are restricted to online um, forms unless you buy purchase a physical topographical map. And in that case, you probably won't have access to it in a crisis scenario in which there's no electricity, no Wi-Fi, no connectivity of cellular devices, etc. Now, second to the topographical map for crisis purposes, it would be very good to have a road atlas. These things are effective, not just for navigating around traffic patterns, but also to know where locations are, the names of those locations, how to communicate with people in the area. And also you can use the number markers 
to determine distance, direction. You can use the markers as well on the map to determine your physical location and where north might be, just simply based off of a road atlas. Now when it comes to preparation for restriction of movement and finding your way around the area, nothing beats good old-fashioned scouting the location yourself. You know, go out driving, go down, uh, perhaps get lost a little bit and find your way back. Go down the paths less trodden. Actually go out and experience the area and learn it firsthand where things are and what to do. And usually when somebody's grown up in an area, if they went outside and played and traveled around and rode bicycles, they have a home court advantage, meaning they know the area, they know the back roads, they know the trails, they know all the different places they can go, even when everything else is blocked and closed. Now, the next element for uh, preparation for crisis is to have trade goods. Trade goods are can come in many different forms. They can be something extremely mundane, but the idea behind this is what is most readily available, what will people trade for, what will people need. Of course, the more trade goods that you have, the more that you might have to protect them. So simply having a certain supply on hand that can get you going in a crisis situation so that you're not starting from zero would be a good idea. A very versatile trade, trade good in a crisis scenario would be rice. That's because rice is easy to store. It takes a while to go bad. It's a movable food that's recognized by most people. Whereas you might have other things that are very useful, but they're not recognized by most people. And in a crisis scenario where people are thinking with their emotions and not their brain, they might look at something, not recognize it, and write it off as something they don't want. And then they'll go look for something that they do recognize. Especially important with food. Food and water are very important in crisis situations. And you could have liquids that are very effective, but if people don't know what they are, they might write them off and thus they are not really good for trading. But rice is, far as I'm aware, globally is recognized as a good food that uh, can provide everything that's required or most things that are required for eating during a crisis situation. Of course, it does require water. But also the idea of a shelf life of certain goods. Some things have a shorter shelf life than others. It wouldn't make for very good trade goods. Trade good is the operative term here. So you're collecting something not to use it yourself, but to trade it for other things that you would use uh, along with whatever your stores might be. This is specifically designed for being able to trade. Now, the two things that are highly prized in most crisis situations and are well known as very valuable trade goods are alcohol and tobacco. Of course, if you are holding on to very valuable trade goods, then it also means that you have something that's worth stealing, which means you have to protect it. It's less likely that people are going to attack you for your rice, where you can go around and trade those. On the other hand, if you have a stockpile of liquor or cigarettes or any other sort of tobacco thing, then you're going to have to defend those, even though you can trade them at a high value for other items. Now, the next scenario that perhaps is the most trained for, but usually incorrectly, is the individualized attack. This is the idea that you are yourself in a personal crisis in which somebody is trying to attack you, possibly kill you, maim you, or otherwise. This could come in many different forms, and it might not always be physical. However, most of the time, when an individual is prep preparing for defense against an individualized attack, they're thinking of physical. But you can be individualized, or you can be attacked individually, financially, through your resources, or you can be attacked by the, uh, have attacks done anyway against the people around you, but you're the individual target of that attack. So there's many different scenarios when it comes to individualized attacks that need to be prepared for, and I'm not going to go all over all of them. I will simply go on the physical aspect of an individualized attack for this video. Now, when it comes to physical, individualized physical attacks, most of the time people are trained for the ludicrous and the unlikely. One of those scenarios is the random robber hiding down a dark alley that nobody else is walking down. And then just like as Hollywood movies show, the victim walks down that alley and then gets mugged, maybe shot or stabbed. 
and that person had to have been, at least as far as the implications are, waiting for that individual to come down the alley. It's unlikely that most people are going to be hiding in a dark alley, just like you're unlikely to get have to engage in a duel nowadays uh, around honor or whatnot. And there is some implication that that didn't even happen in the past. And that's just a fabricated lie about how people acted. Most individualized attacks physically today come in the form of an individual who believes they can get away with it. This could be an aggressive coworker who just has a temper and they uh, lose their mind for a little bit. And because they've probably done it before, they know they can get away with attacking somebody uh, out of emotional, uh, in, in unstable emotional state. Say somebody who's got a mental disability, they're not going to get held accountable for attacking somebody because you did something that ticked them off or quote unquote triggered them. This is becoming more and more common today. So it is important to understand that the more than common aspect of an individualized attack will come from those who believe that they're protected from consequence. And in that case, the only consequence that can be given them is your response to the attack so that they don't even get to the, um, to the moment of being able to get away with it. And that will, of course, come down to things like martial arts training and sort of physical preparations for that type of situation. Now, perhaps today, the most common form of personal attack will come through natural causes, accident by natural causes or death by natural causes. And this will come down to, say, somebody injecting you with something that causes damage or harm that is intended for that purpose, actually, or being given something that your system can't handle and the other person doesn't think that or, or doesn't know that it will cause that effect. And, of course, naturally, usually there's a component there that they're free from liability. There's an insurance policy for medical malpractice. There's uh, something there and say, like, you find in government circles, you've got insurance for negligence in, in jobs, in different on construction sites, things like that. Those are your more likely attacks of a personal nature, somebody sabotaging you. Uh, perhaps if you're in a construction project, they sabotage what you're working with that ends up to a catastrophic accident and nobody's the wiser. Those are in fact the more than common type of personal attacks that somebody will experience today. And being prepared for that means being aware, understanding what somebody's trying to do to you, and also noticing whether or not there's anomalies in your environment that may lead to an accident that may or may not have actually been planned. Now, the elephant in the room, as it were, of likely scenarios that people have to deal with, but more than likely have no training on how to deal with it or to prepare for it, will be the circumstance of the home siege. And this is something that is feared by a lot of people today, but they don't prepare for it because they're trained not to. They're also not trained how to think about these things, and so people just don't talk about it because they're afraid of the reprisal for even mentioning this concept of the home siege, which is an extremely likely scenario for most people today. And dealing with this requires the guts to do it. And in some cases, guts are out of the question. You have no other choice but to confront it. And being prepared for it would be much better than not. Now, the first thing to think about when you're talking about a home siege situation is your backstop. Now, I know this is a rendering of a backstop for a baseball field, but the concept is the same. Your backstop should be designed to stop things. Now, this can, can come in many forms, and it has to do with the understanding of a, your environment and choosing which where a situation might take place. If somebody is sieging your home, it means that they are targeting you and they will go through your walls. So you want to make sure that your walls can't be going, gone through, or if they are going to be gone through, that you control the outcome. And this comes down, of course, to having a backstop, essentially restricting access and movement and controlling where a seizure might enter, because usually that's the idea of a home siege. Of course, you can have many different types of home siege. You can have the cutting off of supplies, just like anyone knows with the usual 
classic castle scenario in which somebody sieges the castle. They don't necessarily try to breach the walls. They simply try to starve out the inhabitants. And that's a very common type of home siege that some people might deal with today, having their electric cut off, their water cut off, all of those types of things until they comply with what the sieger is wanting them to do. Now, a useful item in most homes is the refrigerator. While most homes today are built out of, essentially speaking, tissue paper, the walls are very weak, the refrigerator is still built relatively robust and many are large. These things can be used for cover in the case of firearms use or explosives. There's many uses for a refrigerator, but understanding its use as a, an, effect, an effective backstop is important to preparing for a home siege because that way, if nothing else, you know that if the situation happens, you can use your refrigerator for a different purpose than what it was designed for. Of course, naturally, if there are firearms involved, it's probably going to spoil the food inside of it. <laughs> but that might not be a concern for somebody who's under siege. Naturally, when it comes to firearms, the idea of a backstop keeps the penetration of a bullet from going through to the other side. If your walls are made out of tissue paper, then that's not going to stop bullets. And if you're sieged, you might be shot through the wall. So in that case, you want to insulate wherever you decide to make your stand, as it were, because usually in the case of a siege, you have no way out. You're stuck there, essentially. And your idea of fighting back is to entrench yourself and make them come to you. Or if you do decide to go out, just like the sally out inside of castles, you do so in a way that you can then easily get back in to your fortified area. And so that's the idea here is fortification of your home against siege. The story that's applicable to this type of scenario is that of the big bad wolf and the three little pigs. Most of us live in the straw house, which the big bad wolf huffs and puffs and blows down. So you want to get yourself from the straw house to the brick house in which the wolf huffs and puffs and nothing happens. Now, in most scenarios today, the siege is going to be conducted by the thugs of municipal corporations or the state corporations that call themselves government. And this is because somebody behind them who controls that mechanism or they themselves that are inside of that mechanism, they want the property. Most people prepare for the home siege based off of the idea of them coming to take your firearms. On the other hand, more than likely, they desire somebody's property. And if that person does not want to give up their property, then they're going to be facing a home siege because they're going to get your property one way or the other, or you're going to inflict such nasty casualties and consequences on them that they won't ever dare to attempt something like that again. Of course, on the other hand, the idea of standing your ground in that type of scenario, most people are afraid of today because we are trained to be afraid of the force that will be brought against us. But either way, many people face this scenario every day and they have no other choice than to fight back and they usually end up dying because of it and not killing the people who are doing it to them. And that's because they did not prepare for it. Now, when it comes to any events that involve violence or a staged siege of somebody's home, Generally, the first go-to is to shut down everything to control and close off the area to isolate the individual. Especially when it comes to the phony law enforcement, they only have so many people available. And so when they go after a particular piece of property, they can only go usually after one at a time because they have to shut down the whole block and they have to shut down the whole area. And while they might not be able to go after every single person that lives in an area, if the person who they do go after is the unfortunate one, the target of them, then they're going to have this entire force brought against them just to take their home, as it were. Which means that you'll be alone. Now, most of the time when this happens, because we are so trained to follow orders and directions from road signs and things like that, even somebody who is not operating under the color of law can conduct a siege simply by putting up signs, diverting traffic and diverting people around. Now, if they're really professional, then they'll also cut off your means of communication. So unless you've got some sort of semaphore method or smoke signals or something like that, then you probably can't 
depend on your neighbors to come to help because they'll see the road signs, the event and close. They might look around and poke their head, but they won't disobey the signs for fear, of course, getting shot most of the time, especially when you're talking about the phony law enforcement who are unstable thugs. <coughs> So, in that circumstance, you'll be alone, and even if you're not, even if you do have aid that comes to you somehow, miraculously, it is important to prepare yourself to face such a situation alone. Practically speaking, it's much better to pre be prepared for that than to hope that you will get help, you will get salvation, and then not have it come. Now, when it comes to most of the phony law enforcement, as far as their home sieges go, with few exceptions, they usually go through the front door. And this, when you know how they operate, gives you some advantages. If you know the way that they're going to do things, then you can make it easier for them to control their access to it and their response. You can essentially choose your field of battle based off of where you expect them to go. Now, this isn't, of course, going to be something as simple as leaving your front door open, because if somebody saw that, they might get suspicious and say, well, I'm not going to go through there because nobody's just going to leave their front door open. So you might just have to leave the stuff as it is and plan for whatever scenario might come. But you can do little things to try and subconsciously divert them one way or the other. And when it comes to uh, animalistic behavior, such as uh, attacks and home sieges, as you might see with a wolf that circle a deer, the path of least resistance is usually the way to go. Deer, generally speaking, when they're target of a wolf attack, are they're not going to go after the head honcho, the buck, with the very deadly antlers. Instead, they're going to have to go after the weak and the lame, the easy targets. And the same thing comes down to the phony law enforcement. They're less likely to go through the front door of somebody who is armed, and they're more likely to go through the front door of somebody who they think is unarmed. It's the path of least resistance. And so, if they're attempting to siege a house, then instead of going through the window or trying to smash down somebody's wall, they will just go right in through the front door, usually with a ram. In this context, you want to make sure that if somebody sieges your home and then breaks through, that you have a warning system, one, and also that you make it difficult just enough to give yourself time to prepare, to set everything up, to make sure it fatigues them to go through wherever they need to go through. Now, once they inevitably go through where you expect them to go, say through the front door, then you ensure that there is enough of an obstacle in place that they will get caught up in the door and you can do the proverbial stacking of bodies. Now there's a couple ways to do this as anybody knows who's ever had a child. They leave toys around on the floor that obstructs your ability to travel at night. Now imagine a scenario in which somebody is pumped up on adrenaline and they're thinking emotionally and they're going in aggressive and hard charging through the front door well, when they meet something that completely disorients them and screws everything up, everybody coming in behind them is going to have a pileup. Now, one of the ways you can do this, if you're talking about linoleum floors or things other than carpet, as it were, is to put down some sort of slick layer of grease. This will make them slip, trip, fall, and tumble in on each other and make it much easier to inflict nasty and effective casualties on those coming in through your to your home. Now, if it is a carpeted floor, then you can put in on marbles, you can throw out some paper, or anything else that somebody will do the comical slipping on the banana peel effect that will allow you to do things to them because they thought they were hit, uh, dealing with an easy target. Obviously, if you do these preparations, it's less likely that this will happen to you. But if it does, then you're prepared for it, and you can make them rule the day that they messed with you, at the very least. Now, some of the other things that are important to do for preparations for these types of scenarios is to have improvised tools. They can come in many different forms, but when you are an individual operator with limited resources, you can't go out and buy all of the gun tuber stuff all of the things that are promoted on social media about this or that. 
different type of quote unquote improvised uh, mechanisms, you know, like um, um, shotgun round <laughs> alarm system triggers and trip wires and things like that, stuff that's uh, already designed for these purposes. Now you're going to be using what you have on hand. This might mean that you have to put a, a plastic bag pressure plate under your front mat, which leads to a little air, uh, like a, a little air tube that hits a bell or something that lets you know that somebody's at your front door or any other type of things. It's just a basic uh, whatever the crap you have laying around type of improvised mechanism. And improvised tools in many cases can be far more effective than the ones that were designed somewhere else because you know what's going into them, you know how they work, you've designed them and built them, whereas if you buy something from someone else, until you use it, you don't really know whether it's not it's going to work. Now among improvised tools, what's usually underestimated is the use of the water bottle. It is a very versatile tool. If you're low on supplies, of course, you can drink the water and then you can use the plastic bottle itself for all sorts of mechanisms. However, put a little bit of sand, maybe some rocks in it, perhaps run a, a little short fuse to a couple M80s and you've got yourself a pretty handy fragmentation grenade. Now, there's a lot of other uses that you can do with these things, string, stringing up traps, uh, you can also use them as an alarm system. Say you put a water bottle somewhere connected to a wire and then that wire pulls on something somewhere else. Somebody trips that wire and you'll know that they're there because something moved it at least. So there's many versatile uses for water bottle and they're all up to the creativeness of the user of it. But as far as my experience goes, MRE heaters put in water bottles make very effective concussive grenades. So it is very interesting, the usefulness of the simple water bottle. Now, another thing that you're going to have to think about when it comes to the home siege scenario, and essentially speaking, every other scenario, including crisis, is your oxygen intake, your breathing capacity. You'll need to think about different things that you have on hand. It could be something as simple as keeping around a rag that you can put water over your mouth, perhaps having a little bit of charcoal that you can rub into that, which will filter out toxins in the air. Having a gas mask, of course, is the big one. But then, of course, also having different types of herbs or uh, medical supplies that will assist with whatever may come. Somebody who's doing a home siege might not necessarily want to just knock you out. They might want to kill you. And so in that case, you will need things, measures that you have planned for to negate that effect. Most would say a gas mask, but that's not always the required mechanism in some cases. A gas mask will only last for about half hour. Then you have to change out the filter. If you're stuck in a home siege situation and you're stuck inside your house, then you won't be able to change out your filter unless you've got some sort of clean room. So you could possibly try and set up a clean room for that type of scenario. There's many different things that could be done, but also in other scenarios, you need a full, full hazmat gear in order to negate certain things. And so when you get into those extreme levels, it's unlikely that you have preparations for that. But at the very least, in most cases, you can try and prepare for the more than likely events that you might have to face in these scenarios. Another improvised weapon that is versatile that in some cases people know about is the use of the fire extinguisher. Fire extinguisher is not just an effective bludgeon, but when you activate a fire extinguisher, it actually casts out a great deal of debris. That debris can assist in concealing things, and it can also help to stun an attacker or somebody coming through the front door or some buddies. So there's many different uses and versatile uh, applications to the fire extinguisher, including the use of the pressurized system in it, perhaps puncturing a hole in it, using it as a distraction. There are many different uses for a fire extinguisher, and you can even repurpose the metal for things after you have expended the contents. Now, another tool that's important to have on hand when it comes to this, despite what the occupational forces would say because they want your capabilities to be as limited as possible so that they can easily take all your stuff and kill you for it would be to have shape charge. 
shape charges are very versatile. When you don't know how to get through something, you don't have time or you don't have the patience to learn the intricate applications of lock picking every single lock out there, especially when you're talking about locks that can't be picked. Well, brute force might be required, and in that case, you're talking about a shape charge. There's many types of shape charges that somebody can look up. There's a simple one like black powder, in which you use, say, a water, a bag of water to shape the charge. And if you wanted to go through a door or something that is obstructed and you wanted to use a shaped charge for that, then you could put a little bit of black powder on there and then, or a firecracker even, and then you put, say, a bag of water that you tape over it, and thus you have a shaped charge, which may blow out most a door locks. So there's many effective mechanisms, but either way, having at least something, or the understanding even, just that, of how to make a easy, improvised shape charge from what you have around you would be, well, might be the most useful technique that somebody has. Especially when we're talking about a crisis situation where you don't have any food, don't have any resources, and you need to go somewhere to find that, but everything's locked and you don't have any ways of getting it open and taking a crowbar to things might not be the best solution. Well, if you have a little bit of gunpowder handy in the case of bullets, or if you have a little bit of black powder, or if you have some firecrackers, then you might be able to get through that obstacle.